Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking about the wonderful film, The Northman. We are joined today by director and co-writer Robert Eggers, along with co-writer Joan. We are joined with cinematographer Jaron Blaschke, Robin Car Carlin, who's the composer of the film, as well as Sebastian Gainsborough, who's also a composer of the film. And Robert, I wanted to start with a question for you in terms of the visual aspects in how you've told this story, because you've very specifically told the film in a lot of singular shots. I know there were a couple of scenes where you imagined the idea of doing two or three and then really centered it down. Um, but I was interested in, in having that idea early on in the creation of this film, how that in turn also influenced the way that you were writing films writing scenes and developing this story and knowing the way that you were going to bring us into the scenes in a very intimate way where the camera would always be right in central focus with wherever you wanted to draw our eyes. Well, I think um, <clears throat> that the, the, the there, there's a sort of um, late period part of the writing process that happens when I'm working with, with Jaron. Uh, so, I, you know, Shion and I wrote this together and, uh, and I think for us, we, we very much just thought of it as a, a story. And there are certainly some sequences that I, uh, understood the cinematic language that I wanted, but I think often when I'm writing, I picture bad TV coverage, uh, which is the thing that I try to absolutely not do at all costs. But oftentimes that's what I'm picturing when I'm writing, uh, to, to get us from A to B. Um, <clears throat> but I, but, but always, uh, uh, I felt that this would be, uh, you know, the antithesis of, a lot of the conventional um, action epics of today and that we would be telling it uh, in these long shots that kind of just, just they just keep you more immersed uh, in, in the storytelling because uh, the, the camera is always focused on what we as storytellers want you to be focused on. And of course, I'm very interested in these period details, uh, but there's, but because um, we're, we're shooting in this way, there's no, like uh, B camera cutaway to like the cool looking hunting dogs. Like the hunting dogs are part of the whole mise en scène, and like and you you get them as as a as a texture and part of the world. But we're really focused on, you know, the most important part of the of the story in each each moment by uh, shooting this way. I love that. And and shown in terms of of writing the story, um, you know, it's it's a time period where there was brutality that was part of the Viking culture. And yet I know Robert has spoken extensively in, about this film in that there was always a, a, a an idea of never overly glorifying it, overly celebrating it, but making choices that were necessary for the story. And so even in terms of character, you know, we understand Alexander Skarsgård's character being so primal and guttural in the story. We understand Nicole Kidman's background and her story as a woman in that time period for survival. And so I was interested in, in writing these characters and writing the narrative, um, how you in essence would be asking yourself those questions of how do we acknowledge and absorb the brutality of the time period without overly sensationalizing it by really focusing it on the intimacy of character portrayals? Well, uh, you know, uh, having grown up with these stories, with the sagas, you know, and the medieval tales, you know, uh, the violence is just something that you take for granted, you know, it's there, it's a part of the story. It, it uh, It's um, inflicted on people and it's used by people when necessary. And uh, there is no question about doing it or not doing it, you know. That is the difference between this uh, Amleth and uh, good old Hamlet, you know. There is never any doubt about inflicting violence. It just comes when it needs to come. And, uh, and I think uh, when you know that, when you know that that, that, that is a part of the, of the, of the character's worldview, and that is the tool they have to express themselves, you know, then it uh, just goes in with the character. So a um, uh, female character like uh, Gudrun, for example, who is not a sword wielding uh, uh, shield maiden, but uh, a queen and then a, a farmer's wife, she has other means of uh, inflicting violence and that is by inciting violence and, 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 and um, operating behind the scenes, making sure that the violence happens when it needs to happen. So I think it is, you know, it's a, it's a narrative tool. It's a part of the emotional makeup of these people. 
Absolutely. And, and Jaren, in, in coming over to you in terms of a lot of the camera work, you know, I know there was a huge development process in terms of storyboarding, working with a storyboard artist. And it sounds like that in it, in itself would, when you would get images back from the storyboard artist and go through those details, that there would still be times where it was kind of an editing process of how are we going to film this, especially with everything Robert was talking about with singular shots. Um, and so as you were going through the storyboarding process with the extensiveness of what that looked like for a film like this, how did that help you in honing down and making certain choices in terms of the cinematography and the visual aspects of this film? Well, the, yeah, that's the, that's the thing that we sort of realized because, you know, Rob expressed early on that, you know, I mean, the, the movies that inspired him are, you know, it's foreign European cinema from the 60s and 70s a lot of the time. So it's, it's you know, reaching to those, but it's, it's um, in order to have these sort of, to live in the moment, uh, in the shot, it's, you know, you can only really focus on one thing at a time, you know, so you want, you kind of have to, you're pre-editing really, and it's like you, you have to kind of put them in sequence. You can't really have, you know, someone notice two things at the same time and, and go back and forth. You, so it, it, that's how the kind of the, the story elements uh, might get shuffled slightly, you know, it's like, it's about this, and then it's about this. It's not, you know, uh, you don't really get either, you, you reach for both at the same time. So that's kind of what it, you know, um, how the shot uh, would, would whittle this down. And a lot of times you just need to draw it to sort of see which one, you know, um, the, the better order, you know, what the compromises are um, when you have a when you have a shot that has to cover two pages, for example. So, um, yeah, I mean, thankfully, you know, we never really reached this far before. So thankfully we had a, a lot of prep to do so, you know, and, and then, um, Troubled as it was, you know, COVID really helped us too because it gave another few months to sort of work all this stuff out. So, you know, we arrived on set, it was, you know, it's just here's what we're doing. And, you know, and we also had the we also had standing sets over the summer. So we could, you know, um, if not visit, then you know, we had plans, you know, and I would have a little a piece for a lens, you know, that was a whole lot. That was it here. You know, for you just have a you have one of these, you know, that with a I don't know, you can see what this is. You can't anyway. It's like a it's just a V a transparency you put on a on a plan. You can see what the camera's going to see. And you can roughly figure it out from afar. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of that work was just done beforehand because you know being on sets hard enough. Amazing. I I love the show and tell there as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, I don't think that came across, but yeah. <laughs> And then Sebastian and Robin, you know, Robert, Robert gave you this note of really wanting there to be a texture of everything feeling very brutal and very harsh and caked in mud when it came to the sound of this movie. And so as you started to figure out what's the, what's the tonality that we want for the overall sound of music composition, what are the instruments that are going to capture that? How did that influence a lot of the early choices you were making before you even sat down and started writing individual pieces for the story itself? Um, I mean, we did a lot of research. Uh, we spoke to people who, who were sort of, you know, experts in their field, whether that was like Karen Erickson Buck, who's this uh, amazing Colnin singer, or Paul Hoxbro, who's kind of like a Nordic music expert. Uh, we, yeah, we just tried to do a lot of research. Um, we weren't particularly familiar with the instruments going into the project, so that was interesting. Um, sort of trying to figure out what you could get out of those. Um, but luckily, uh, we found that they, they lended themselves very well to uh, the, the roughness that Rob wanted, um, which at times was almost, it was too rough. So initially, the plan was we were going to uh, score the entire movie just using these sort of relatively obscure niche Viking instruments, but they were so rough and ready and kind of like almost unwieldy at times that we uh, we sort of realized that we weren't going to be able to score the entire thing just using those instruments. Um, yeah. And, and Sebastian, off the back of that as well, you know, there's obviously moments where there's certain sounds that come back in and play throughout the narrative. You know, there's the use of the drum kind of almost as a rhythmic heartbeat when the tension's rising. You know, again, there's there's a lot of kind of like metallic sounds at the beginning of the film with Alexander's character on screen when, when it, things are more primal in terms of the narrative. And so how did you set about finding the different sounds that you really wanted to bring us back into? Because each time we hear one of those things, again, it's just building on the experience and the emotion of the film before that's been building up to that point 
Yeah, I mean, as Robin, <clears throat> as Robin said, as we went along through the process, we realized that we'd have to make certain compromises. So there are some academics out there who will say that the Vikings had no drums, for example, and others that say that's ridiculous. And yeah, there are drums, they just would have, you know, they, they wouldn't have lasted this long. Um, so the, the drum is a good example. Um, to begin with, we played with the idea of maybe mm, no drums. That could be really interesting in this context. But as we went on, similarly with realizing that we needed things like contemporary strings, we also realized, of course, we need we need drums. It's not going to work without drums. So it was a very dynamic process in that respect. I love that. And and Robert and Jaren, one of the scenes that I wanted to ask the two of you about is that moment where it's that confrontation with Alexander Skarsgård's character, you know, and Nicole Kidman, you know, he's he's finally reconnecting with his mother with an idea of what that moment's going to be. But the way that you've lit that so specifically in so many different ways with just a singular light source of fire is, is telling so much about the story. There's a moment where she's really in the light when he first sees her and then she becomes much more drenched in shadow as she starts to reveal her backstory and then the kind of backlighting that comes in when she's being more seductive towards him um and so I was interested in how you conceptualized in and came up with setups like that even where even just within a singular scene where you've got one light source you're finding all the different ways that you can tell a story visually in a singular moment I mean I think that I think that there's you, you know J Jaron would say that 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 scene there was some luck to it <laughs> I, you know I I think that when you have this central uh, fire in the middle of every room, that's kind of your lighting source. It is quite limiting, uh, but we found that we were able to find a, a, some blocking that really uh, worked for the scene, but also happened to have like really dynamic lighting for Nicole's um, character in that scene. That was a, that that was a scene where uh, you know the limited light sources really helped us. But I'm sure Jaron can speak to. Uh, how difficult it was that in the day scenes, you know, there's no windows in Viking architecture. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of stuff. I mean, uh, it's it's. I really like doing period films because it's you know almost like Rob with you in production design. Like this is this is what it is. Um, you know, you don't you don't have all these options of. Yeah, you know, here's a desk lamp or a fluorescent tube or a you know sodium vapor lamp out the window. It's just like you know. And this is the epitome of that. It's just uh, we, you know, we have we have smoke holes and we have fire and we have daylight. You know, and just do those three things in moonlight. You know, let's just do those four things and and there you go. Just emulate that. And you know, I think I'm pretty imaginative, imaginative when it comes to blocking and camera, but uh, with lighting, I'm really not. You know, I'm always just trying to uh, block around what the light would be. So um, if I need to cheat, it's always kind of based on you know making it feel like the, the single source that's that's there. You want to see this moment, then you block them um, in a position, you know, uh, you, you block them around the, the the fire in this case, you know, or if it's a later film uh, around the window, for, for instance. So, um, yeah, this one just kind of fell into place because, you know, he's, uh, she's moving toward him and uh, she happened to be in front of the fire. It was just there. And then she gets in, you know, just kind of this horror movie moment where it, kind of goes up her face that you, you know, you're told never to do with your, you know, uh, with your movie stars. Uh, Rob was good with it and it suited the story. And then she kind of gets in front of it and then soft light and it's kind of beautiful and backlit. And then it, you know, it changes through all these phases and that just, I mean, um, I like to say that it was planned, but it kind of fell into place. I have to say. I love that. And, yeah, and I, Robert, I, sorry. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, uh, use that scene to mention that uh, that the other weapon of choice in the in the medieval stories is language and is what you say, and you use it very much in the same way as weapons. So people in the film, they only speak when absolutely necessary. <laughs> and then what happens in that scene is that you get like all of a sudden this release of language when Gwydron reveals everything. And uh, she shows her what's, go what's been going on in her mind, in her life. And uh, she uses the sharpest tool available, and that is language. And he just is speechless, more or less, you know. And uh, as Schiffbrand, as his father, as he would say. 
<laughs> so, uh, so I think I think this scene is a good example of how we, in the in the storytelling, how we are using the aesthetics of the medieval uh, sources, and uh, we we do that throughout the thing. And uh, it was interesting to hear you talking about the music. You you got these instruments, and you do what you can with them, and and you make something completely new out of old material. You keep the rawness of it, and then it just all comes together. And I think we do very much the same with the story and the language, the use of the use of dialogue. Absolutely. And 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 actually for you, Joan and Robert, off the back of that, you know, one of the things I think is so stunning about this film is you, you have the scope of what this film is and the way that it's telling the story, but actually it's a very centered and grounded character driven piece. Um, and so I was really interested for the two of you in in throughout the writing process in in how essentially centering everything back through Amleth, this really personal emotional journey that he's going on, allowed you to tell a story which married those two different versions of a really large scale scope film um, on a grander scheme, but driving it in such a grounded emotional space for the two of you. Um, well, I, I think that in some ways uh, it was closer to some saga material with other sort of subplots and time with other characters in earlier drafts. And then it became more and more about Amleth. But then in the post-production uh, process, you know, we actually had a lot of scenes that were from uh Guthrun and Fjellner's perspective. And we found that it was actually like stepping on Ambla's story to, to include them, you know, uh, I'm sure Sean can follow, follow that up. <laughs> no, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we realized that we needed just to stay with him, you know, and, uh, luckily enough, there was enough material to do that. And, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, that's the film it became. Amazing. And, and Sebastian and Robin, and coming back to the music a little bit more, um, you know, when you look at the track listing, there's there's so many different pieces and there's so many different directions that that takes in terms of the way that it enhances the emotion of the film. And yet there's also so many moments where a track is maybe only about a minute long. And that's a very common thing throughout the, the score as well. And so what are the challenges that come with trying to really bring us further into a scene, elevate the emotional trajectory of where you're taking the audience, but having such a finite amount of time to really build the scope of what that's going to be musically. Um, yeah, I mean, that was one of the trickiest things I think about doing the score was that there's almost this sort of emotional whiplash. Um, <laughs> like the movie moves quite quickly. Um, so trying to sort of keep up with that and not having a huge amount of time to build up to, you know, whatever the emotion is that you're trying to create. Uh, yeah, it was tricky. But um, but I think at the same time, like each scene was just so well-rounded, it made it easier to kind of like really define what the emotion should be. And essentially, you know, like the film is for the most part being seen through the eyes of Amleth. So, you know, just going back to that scene uh, with um, Amleth, and his mother you know we we scored that as as if it was a horror scene because from Amnes' perspective what's happening is a horror show you know everything that he has known to be true the whole reason why he's there it's just sort of destroyed within a couple of minutes and you know when she well i won't give away too much but you know it's it's um yeah it, it's very much so scored from his perspective um with a little bit of Olga from time to time because there needed to be some some softness as well it would have been exhausting if the entire score had just been relentless and brutal and muscular as I remember Rob would say quite often <laughs> <laughs> and how about for you Sebastian what were the challenges that came with that from your perspective um I think uh, it was more challenging at the beginning when we hadn't quite kind of nailed um the, the, the sonic character, the motifs of, of the characters of Amleth or Olga. And once we started to know what, you know, their, their, their music was, as it were, their motif, then um, it, it, when it was working really well, it was just like a puzzle. It's like, okay, we know um, that this is Amleth's motif, but 
instead of being in this violent situation, he's in a romantic situation or whatever it might be. So you, you have this raw material which represents the character and then the, the fun part is expanding or contracting or changing it to fit whatever's going on in the story. Yeah, I really, really love that. I mean, I'm so impressed by the incredible work that you've all done and just the level of detail that goes into every single choice that we see and that we hear on screen is incredible. So congratulations on a phenomenal film. And thank you so much to all of you for talking about this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.